So maybe after that, I don't know. I'm going to do some interviews probably this week, maybe next week on some, uh, some shows. I see. None. However, my aunt was caught in somewhere near. She was uh, good, no injuries, dude. She's so lucky. When do you get your roids? Two weeks. Two weeks from today. Two weeks from today, I'm going to have a buff neck. So for anybody that's uh, new or on YouTube watching, you're like, wow, who is this guy? Uh, he's a guy with neck pain. Uh, when I retired out of the military, I had issues with three of my de uh, discs in my neck. And uh, I've, been doing, I've been doing shots and everything in my neck, but they haven't been working. So I've been waiting six months to get three shots in a facet joint that I'm having issues with. And then if it works, they're going to go back in and they're going to burn the nerve that is there. So that way I won't feel it anymore. Uh, will it hurt? I mean, not for a really tough guy like me. I mean, if anything, it might hurt my feelings. No, I'm kidding. It, actually, you don't really feel it because they numb you up. They, they numb you up. So I'm awake during the whole thing. I know how this goes. So I've done it. I Two? I've either done it two. I think it's only th two. So basically, I take my shirt off. Uh, I hug the doctor. He tells me to, to get off of him and lay on the table. And uh, so I do face down, put my, my head in, in the pillow. And then the nurse, like, washes my back or, where you know, the area where it's going to go. And the doctor has an x-ray machine on me. So he's literally driving the needle while looking at the screen. And he goes down until he hears, which is, is really freaky. Just, I, please, uh, please bear with me when I say this. So he drives the needle down into, like, the disc area. And when he hits the when he hits the area, two things happen. One, it sounds like you smashing a rice crispy between your fingers. And then two, there's a there's like negative pressure there. So it actually like sucks the 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 steroids out of the needle itself. Anyway, it's crazy. You don't feel it though. Like you feel a light, like warm sensation in your chest, but that's it. Seriously, it's not a huge deal. Not a huge deal. So it's a it's a massage day. I wish. I wish. It's not quite a massage. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes. And then he pulls the needle out. He uh, taps me on the back. He's like, all right, I need you to stand up slowly. And then I stand up really fast. And I say, dude, thank you very much. I'm heading home. And then he's like, uh, I'm going to need you to just sit and chill for like 30 minutes. So I make sure that you're fine. <laughs> After my pregnancy, I get this pain where the epidural was put. I'm sure as I get older, it's going to get worse. Oof. Well, they say like no matter what, if you cut yourself, if you take uh if you have surgery or anything like that, you'll never be 100%. You'll always be at most 95%. I wonder if they did it wrong and you got like scarred tissues or something. Oh, that's rough, though. That is super rough. Yoinks. <laughs> oh, God, green face. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, I think we just learned something as a, as a team here. <laughs> hey, very nice. I love hearing that. That's awesome. I've only had one surgery. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've had my appendix out. And for the last, like, uh, <laughs> so for the for the last like 15 years I've been telling all my kids that those are uh, that's it's a birth scar because it's like it's like this big and they're like I can't fit through there I'm like yeah that was my c-section you guys came out of there I, I used to tell my daughter all the time that I carried her for nine months she really thought so for a while they cut my belly button you got lucky dude they went in from the side for me dude they they took it like right out I was they said like they had me in an, in an ambulance I was 20 years old I was doubled over in pain, went to the hospital, and they were like, yeah, you need to get to the operating room, like, now. And I was on the verge of having my appendix explode. That feels bad. Never had a surgery, but I had to have a stitch on my balls. I've actually had stitches on my balls. I've had a vasectomy. Best thing ever. Unbelievable. Like, to me, having a vasectomy was like the equivalent of somebody taking me to Six Flags every single day for like a week with, with no lines in the ride. <laughs> we'll tell the story if you guys want to listen. Hey, listen, I'm going to hard pass on that right now. 
But listen, definitely hit me up on that later. I was a big girl when it was done. It was probably difficult to see the spy, maybe. Oh, uh, that's possible, too. Or you could have had just bad people working on you, maybe. I mean, that's that sucks either way. Do you have dimples? Only on my butt cheeks, dude. That's the only place. No, I'm kidding. I don't have any dimples. I'm too fat for dimples. Like, I feel like fat people don't have dimples. Like, see, if I smile, hey, see, I'm way too fat for those. Man, I'm so jealous because dimples, I feel like dimples, they just, I don't know, there's something about them that makes you look cuter and stuff like that. So I'm really bummed out. I had two surgeries. They're not fun. I, I don't know if wisdom teeth count, but they did put me in the hospital and they fractured my jaw when I got the bottom ones out. So that was kind of nasty, but... Bro, I was uh, about to say, I got to get a surgery there. Oh, yeah, yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> Yikers. Hey, listen, when I, got my, when I got my vasectomy, I went in at like 6.30 in the morning. I had taken a Valium and a Percocet like an hour before. I didn't even know he was doing it. I, I had him and his assistant in tears. I was telling, I was like, it was almost like I was doing a 45-minute set on stage. Like, I was just killing it for some reason, 7 a.m., and we were all just laughing so hard, and he's like, all right, you're good to go. I was like, wait, 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 wait. You guys already started? <laughs> Dude, I was so high from that that I made the guy that drove me take me to IHOP for a plate of pancakes like three hours later, and I literally face-planted into my pancakes. <laughs> that was terrible. My dad has dimples where his scar was. Wait, wait, where's his scars, sir? Sir, are we still talking about the same thing? <laughs> My grandmother and dad had theirs removed. Their what? Their wisdom teeth? Their appendix? Or their testicles? What are we talking about? Hey, what's up, Icon? Yo! <laughs> Y'all are lucky. As yeah, I am super lucky. Super lucky I don't need an epidural. Holy crap, those things... Yo, I've watched, I've watched uh, that shit, and that is not good. Not good. Eat God, what's up, dude? Nice to see you. My country blew up. Icon, are you in Lebanon? Because that's what we're about to talk about, dude. Oh, shit. Do you love meeting people from all walks of life? I do. Like, the more, the more like, <clears throat> people I, I meet from other countries, uh, religion, like, education, just jobs, like, all of it. I find it all fascinating. When my mother used to make me go to church when I was younger, I used to draw people in church. I just, I am, I'm a people watcher and I am fascinated by people. I'm just absolutely fascinated. What are your thoughts on uh, this year? Can you give us a summary of things that happened in 2020? <laughs> Jesus, you really want me to cry, don't you, Tyler? Well, let's see. It's been such a huge year. So, uh, you know, Donald Trump was the third president in U.S. history to ever be impeached. But he was the first one to ever be impeached twice. Uh, what else happened? Uh, God, there's so much. It feels like it feels like I've lived in a decade in the last six months. Obviously, we have Beirut, uh, the whole Brexit thing, the coronavirus. Uh, we have all the mass firings. Like, like uh, Bojo got uh, Bojo and uh, Bolsonaro, whatever his name is, in Brazil got COVID. Uh, we've seen, wait, I don't even know which year, what did Iran, Iran shot down an airplane full of civilians cause they thought, uh, Americans were on it or something. I don't know if that was last year or this year anymore. Dude, this, uh, I mean, Herman Cain died. Uh, what else? Dude, we just, we've had so much nonstop, man. I don't think I can give you a rundown to be honest. There's, there's just so much. Yeah, man, I, the list would probably be longer than my grocery list. Appendix? Okay, good. Your bio doesn't lie? Oh, no. What does my bio say? <laughs> oh, no. My bio doesn't lie. I don't... Maybe... Should it, should it lie? Should I go in there and readjust it? Hi, I'm a nice guy. I'm only 42, and uh, I like people. <laughs> it's been great so far, especially for the U.S., Brazil, India, and Russia. Yeah, ditto. What's up, Daniel? Uh, yeah, Australia burned. Forgot about those wildfires. Those are pretty crazy. Saw the video of Beirut. Actually, unreal. Dude, it's unbelievable. Uh, burned for the billionth time. That's true. 
Yeah, we've had a lot of people. Uh, so so many poor decisions. We're gonna talk about that. Love meeting people walks of all life. Yeah, me too. The more the, the more the better. That's one reason why I love going out to the bar. Because if I go out to the bar, it's it's just so good. Hey, congrats on that rank there, Daniel. Very nice. Hey, let's jump into it. Listen, the first thing I want to do is read three paragraphs. All right, it's not a whole lot. I'm just going to read three paragraphs. And then this will start the conversation because I feel like this guy may have very well um, covered it. Oh, look. Wait, what? Oh, it's on the wrong one. Hold on one second. Because I was, I was going to tweet, but I decided against it. I decided against it. Oh, wait, not that. Um, one thing that we're going to do. There's my Firefox. Let's get this. Let's do this one. Here we go. Ah, oh, shoot. Move it out of that monitor, and now we're wide. Okay. I'm also going to bring this up so I can actually like read it and you guys can kind of see it. Okay. These are the three paragraphs I'm going to read. Somebody was kind enough to actually uh, cover this. So I, I like it. Hold on. Before I do, let me just make sure. Love meeting people from all walks of life. Oh yeah, dude. Right on point then. See? Um, yeah, this is very sad. Very sad. Only subs here. No way. Everybody's here. I don't do sub only chat. I don't do follower only chat either. My chat is wide open for everybody. I got like 20 new oh, Jesus, dude, that's a lot. No, I have no interest in doing sub or follower only. Absolutely not. Um, I, I would, I would never. I'll do it in Discord, but I would never do it on Twitch. All right. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna read it out loud. You guys do not have to spend time reading this. This, is, I'm actually gonna read it. So, here we go. Hey, should I put my, um, oh no, my daughter took my glasses, son of a bitch. All right, here we go. <clears throat> on, on 23 September 2013, the Russian-owned uh, Moldovan-flagged cargo ship MV Rosas set sail from Butumi, Georgia, to Biera, Mozambique, carrying 2,750 tons of an ammonium nitrate. During the trip, it was forced to port in Beirut with engine problems. After inspection by Port State Control, the Rosas was found unseaworthy and it was forbidden to set sail. Eight Ukrainians and one Russian were aboard, and with the help of Ukrainian consul, five Ukrainians were repatriated, leaving four crew members to take care of the ship. The owner of the Rosas went bankrupt, and after the charterers lost interest in the cargo, the owners abandoned the ship. The Rosas then quickly ran out of provisions while the crew were unable to disembark due to the immigration restrictions. Creditors also obtained three arrest warrants against the ship. Lawyers argued for the crew's repatriation on compassionate grounds due to the danger posed by the cargo still aboard the ship and an urgent matters judge in Beirut allowed them to return home after being stuck aboard the ship for about a year. The dangerous cargo was then brought ashore in 2014 and placed in a building, Hangar 12, at a port for the next six years. This is hard to read. Not difficult in, in comprehension just because how long it's been there and the amount of loss of life and everything. Various custom officials had sent letters to judges requesting a resolution to the issue of the confiscated cargo proposing that the ammonium nitrate either be exported, given to the army, or sold to private Lebanese explosives com company. Letters had been sent on 27 June 2014, 5 December 2014, yada, 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 yada. One of the letters sent in 2016 noted that judges had not replied to previous requests and pleaded. So... That is a lot to break down here. That is that has got to be one of the largest. There's a picture of it too. Let's let's bring that up. Just it says that it killed at least 135 pieces uh, people. But listen, if there was anybody, anybody in this zone, they were probably vaporized, and it will probably be weeks to find out. Tens of thousands of people died. This is incredible. 
here for the audio book. Thanks. I appreciate it. Can VIPs make polls too? I actually don't know. Yeah, that is a lot. Tons. 2,750 tons. That's bomb making material. That is unbelievable. Six years it was there. Nobody. Well, then you go on, and, and I don't even have the rest of it pulled up. So, stored in the building next to it was confiscated fireworks. And then somebody went into that building and was doing welding, which set everything off. At first, I was like, so the government stole the ship's cargo and then kept it there for six years because they couldn't make money off of it or something. And then this thing blows up. And just for context, when I, at the beginning, when I said that, um, when, when I said that I had to remove a post from my Facebook group. So the guy had posted a picture of uh, like the U.S. military in Beirut in 1983 where a few Marines were killed. And then it was a picture of this, and it said karma for a few missing Marines. And I wrote back, first of all, this is not karma. This is a tragedy. These things are not comparable. You're talking about massive civilian life and devastation on a country that may not survive something like this at all. And so I ended up deleting it. But that really upset me. Like I had actually for once kind of thought about taking away uh, his ad admin and his moderation um, because of that. It was just such a gross thing to post. It'd almost be like, you know, take a nine 11 picture and another, you know, picture that has nothing to do with it and say karma. Like what, why would you do that? I don't understand. That one was like, I don't think a lot of people really understand to get suicidal, man. We don't want that at all. Uh, let's see. Let's get some feedback here. Yeah, six years of doing nothing. They have this giant bomb sitting in the only port that they have. Now, a lot of people were um, posting that they're out of grains because the grain silo basically uh, took most of the blast. Otherwise, it would have been substantially worse. If I'm not mistaken, uh, let's, let's let me just go back right here. If I'm not mistaken, this little building right here was their grain silo. And you could see the grains like basically all over the, the you know landscape right here. This is there's only like enough for like 15 days to a month for grains in the country. But they had two ships that were absolutely full of grain that they've that that are coming back. So it's not as serious, but it's still serious. Like, still very serious, but not as, like, destitute as the original situation was. There's a lot of people that are dead. This is, like, just unbelievable. And it's just, it's such unneeded catastrophe. Because, hold on one second. I got my bags in. Yeah, the 72 microns. Oh, sorry guys. FedEx came. I got uh, some inventory. Oh yeah, I got some inventory. We'll deal with that after. All right, back to this. Uh, let's see. The whole massive, ex uh, you saw the whole thing. I didn't watch the video, Gremlin. I did not watch the video. Like, I've seen big bombs go off. I don't know if I want this imprinted in this. Like, I... <sighs> Sometimes, like, so, so many people just want to click on the video. They're like, I got to see it. I need it now. I'm one of those people that, like, my, my brain is so visual. Like, if you describe something to me with enough detail, like... I can almost replay the entire thing in great detail in my head. And that's why like sometimes I won't watch a video because it'll be stuck in my head for God knows how long. Wait, it was a nuke. No, it was a non nuclear device. It was the largest one ever detonated 
that was not nuclear. Uh, is chat going to be in the YouTube video? Yes, always is. Always is. You guys are on YouTube. All right. Uh, what else I miss? Yeah, shit is fucked. That is unbelievable. I, I can't watch the video. Seriously. I, I still struggle to watch like 9-11 videos. Hold on. Let me, did I catch it? Did I miss anything? A few missing Marines too. No, 300,000 homeless people. 5% of their country homeless like that. Yeah, very poor taste. And uh, I was I was so angry last night when I saw it. Like, there's one thing I don't like. It's conspiracy theories. Like, at first, this thing was a conspiracy theory. So I deleted one post when this right after this happened. And his post was like, oh, I wonder who did that. And I was like, nope. Boom. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. Like, I don't understand what's wrong with some Americans that, that they think as soon as something happens, boom, we go right to Alex Jones and there's got to be a conspiracy theory for it. It is super, super poor taste. Yeah. Some people say it wasn't nuclear. It was not. It was ammonium nitrate. It was almost 3,000 tons of ammonium nitrate. That is unbelievably uh, explosive, obviously. I don't even know like what buildings it destroyed, but I know it destroyed their only port. This was like 90% of the country's income. So like overnight, this country is devastated. Absolutely devastated. Uh, no. I Well, there was so many threads, Gary, that I didn't even get to that one. Like I read so many comments that were just um, unbelievably sad, just uh, just tear jerkers. I cannot believe this happened. And and here's the thing, like even if you wanted to poke at this, if you wanted to you know go for the conspiracy theory, the amount of loss of life is is just so high. These people didn't ask for this. the The people of Beirut didn't confiscate this cargo off that ship. They didn't put it into the warehouse and let it sit there for six years. This this had unbelievable consequences for, for an entire country. Because it's not just the blast zone. It's all the companies that export, import through the port. It's all the, the companies that are waiting for goods to put on the shelf, such as food, such as you know, necessities. This is this is a, a scale of loss that I don't know if any country has seen in the last 50 years. I just don't think so. Wow. First thing when you got up, she, she showed it to you. Dude, that's crazy. Yeah. Because the bomb was so huge that, that it, it simulated a nuke. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, COVID COVID's a whole different one. We won't touch COVID, but you know, COVID, COVID has lasted long enough and people have either decided to take action or not. This, there was no choice. I mean, there was a choice as far as the port goes, but nobody here was given a choice. Like, you can't put on a mask for an explosion or something. Like, all of that was taken away. Yeah, I hate conspiracy theories too. 5G, all of it. It's just gross. I hope the whole world, you know, helps. This is one thing that I did enjoy when I was in the military in the Air Force because we we did a humanitarian uh, airlift. I hated the segment of the Air Force that delivered bombs on targets because generally those targets were not correct or they were civilians or whatever. There was usually always something messed up as far as that goes. But when, when people would, would tell me like, hey, man, you just helped uh, airlift for these uh, typhoon victims or something or earth earthquakes or whatever, I always felt good about what I did. I wanted to join to make the world better. I wanted to make all of it better, you know. But I'm glad that, you know, the whole world can can hopefully help. I don't know what to expect. 
I mean, you know, the first thing my president said was, uh, ah, it was probably just an attack. How that guy is still in office, seriously, beyond me. How he's not impeached just for saying that and kicked out of office, I don't know. He's making the rest of Americans look so gross. Speaking of that, uh, they're going to announce in one hour. I'm hoping they're going to announce New York City. Uh, we're going we're gonna to look for it when they do. We're going to look for um, Donald Trump's thing when they do the whole announcement whether – well, nobody knows if it's going to be Deutsche Bank. Is that how you say it? Deutsche Bank? Or if it's going to be something else. But I think New York's going to indict him. I don't know. We're going to find out in one hour from now. Uh, they are going to rebuild on their, No, there's no resources. There's no money. This country has been completely torn apart. Fertilizer, which can be used. Yeah, absolutely. Gremlin makes a good point right there. Like That's how the Oklahoma City bomb was done. Fertilizer right in front of the building. Set it off. Boom. Gone. So much destruction. No, GoFundMe could not take care of this for sure. This this has to be like world governments. That's just unbelievable. They'll have that paid in a couple of years. It, it'll probably take 10, 20, maybe even 30 years to recover from this. And that's that's with as much help and support as they can possibly get. I was a little disappointed about Canada donating five million to Lebanon. Five million doesn't seem like enough. It doesn't even seem like a lot. Civilians, yeah. What was your exact job? So uh, my exact job was communications. Well, actually, so the first, uh, the fir my first five years in the Air Force, uh, I refueled jets. And cryogenics, liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen. So I was what's called a, a POL troop, petroleum, oil, and lubricants. And I would drive trucks full of fuel to airplanes, and I would put more gas on them. And then I was bored of that because it's a terrible job. You stink like fuel all day. It's probably super cancerous. And I, I asked if I could go into communications. I switched over to satellite communications, wideband, and telemetry. So I did everything from working at the telescope to shooting a, a phone call through an antenna to a satellite onto somebody else or at, to somebody else on the other side around the world. But my specialty is combat communications. My specialty is being uh, one of the first on the, on the ground with no like security or, or like help or anything like that. So I, I've been trained to be able to be like combat dropped into a location, set up, set up communication for everybody on the ground, and then uh, move on. Let's see. Canada's cool. No, Canada's awesome. Like, I think Canada's super nice. I just don't think $5 million is a lot. Not in this case. Their grain silo probably costs like ten million to build. So I was just shocked by the low number. Um, I, I mean, I would, I would, I thought maybe it was a typo. They probably need like a fifty million donation. I could be wrong though. I think Trudeau is great. I think uh, Mister Handsome Justin is uh, doing a great job up there. His verbiage and the words he uses are absolutely dangerous, for sure. And they're making the rest of us Americans very unsafe. Honestly, don't like some of the stuff he does, but he's... Wait, wait, who are we talking about? Trudeau? I don't know if Eros is talking about Trudeau or Trump. Uh, let's see, impeached or indicted? What do they mean? So the Congress, the House of Representatives, successfully impeached him twice. He is an impeached president. Indicted means New York will be waiting for him to finish his presidency so they can bring him to criminal court and put him in jail. Trudeau, not Trump. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure. 
Uh, yo, Elijah. Hello. Hello. Trump is coming to my city today. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. I watched a video of, his, of a lawyer that was going to sue multiple government organizations for shutting down a book with proof of negative stuff. Yeah, that stuff is bullshit, too. The, the whole, like, NDA stuff is awful. Uh, they're saying it was two explosions. Two? Maybe one from the fireworks, which set off the ammonium nitrate. I would imagine that we're going to get new details to this over the course of more you know, weeks and even months, possibly years. What I'm afraid of is that they're going to scapegoat somebody uh, that was at a low-level position because this is the government. The people at the top that signed off on, on like – on taking this cargo, those are the ones that are responsible. They're the ones that led to this. Every judge that ignored those letters, they are responsible for this. And they're gonna go and they're gonna go after the one like port worker that like had the combination to the building. That's that's what they're gonna end up doing. Watch. Uh you went from gas boy to combat communicator. Yeah, basically, that's exactly what I did. Uh, gas guy. I'll never forget. So uh, I pulled up to this F-15E one day, and it was a new new pair of pilots that popped out. And the, the first pilot was black, which is not a big deal. It's just um, <clears throat> the weird part was he came down the ladder he jumped off the last step. He reached in his pocket, grabbed a can of Copenhagen snuff, grabbed a pinch, put it in his lip, looked at me square in the eye and said, what's up, gas guy? And I looked at him and I was like, did, did, did this black major just chew tobacco like an old redneck here in the South and then refer to me as gas guy? And the answer was, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what he did. I shook his hand and we became like uh, decent, decent, like not friends, but acquaintances. Every time I saw him, I was like, yo, what's up, dude? <laughs> I used to fuel like the uh, wing commanders planes and stuff like that. I'd go out there and do weird shit. The colonels and the general would usually like come down from their flight and be like, yo, what's up? And then like. I remember one – oh, God, this is a sidetrack. I'm so sorry. I, I do want to talk about, about Beirut, but just just a little sides. So we are doing an airlift to Turkey. This was 1999-ish, and I was working weekends. I worked Saturdays and Sundays, and then I would take like Wednesday, Thursday off. So 10 KC-10s came down, and – they each require 50,000 gallons of fuel. I don't know how many that is in liters. That's like 170,000 liters or something like that. And this little car comes across the flight line towards my truck. Now, I've been out there since 7 a.m. just pumping tens and hundreds of thousands of gallons of gas. Matter of fact, this is the only thing I do for 10 hours. I sit on my truck and I look across the miles of concrete with airplanes on it. It's just me and one other person on the flight line. That's it. Me and the guy that's doing everything on the plane to receive the fuel. And the car comes up and parks next to my truck. And I'm like, what the? F like, yo, you can't be here, man. Like, this isn't safe. It was the general. It was the base commander. He hops out of his car with two cups of coffee. And he comes over. He's like, yo, I'm Jack. You mind if I hang out with you for a little while? I brought you a coffee. I was like, Whoa, what? Uh, yeah, and that was the day that I became friends with my uh, with with my wing commander. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's switch back. RNC during coronavirus in my city. Yeah, dude, it's gross. Charlotte. Ugh. I bet you he doesn't go. Jeff Bezos needs to. Well, I mean, is it on him? I don't know if it's on him to donate. I don't see. This is the thing about like when you say Jeff Bezos needs to donate. I disagree. And, and, and it's going to be tomato, tomato, really. I disagree on billionaires 
being encouraged to give away their wealth because that leaves the onus on them to decide what they should give. It's on them to like, to do the right thing. And they're not going to do the right thing. They are not going, listen, one or two billionaires might do the right thing. And then the rest of them will be like, yeah, I'm actually good on that. And then what happens is nothing ever happens. So what we really need is we need reasonable tax law and we need them to pay their fair share of taxes. And then we as a country will decide what we can do with 2% of his wealth as it goes back into the, the public treasury. That's what I would like to see. Uh, let me see. Got to go? All right. Why was that bomb even there? I, because some countries really enjoy confiscating uh, things like that. Like they probably didn't realize what was truly in there, but they were like, oh, yeah, we got free goodies. We'll shove it in the port. Trust me, customs cons- confiscates a lot of stuff around the world. Every country. Every single country. So, you know, they said, oh, your, your boat's not sea- seaworthy. We'll go ahead and take all of your cargo, and we'll see how you do with that. And unfortunately, one was a giant fucking bomb. It's, you know, in one way, it's almost like um, you guys ever like read or, or watch like those porch pirates where they steal the Amazon packages off the porch. I was watching a YouTube video guy where he was like building a glitter bomb. So when you open the box, the thing spins around and glitter goes everywhere. Kind of like payback for stealing from them. It's in a way, part of it is, is that kind of greed. I think it has to be. Why would you hold on to it for six years and, and decide to do absolutely nothing with almost 3,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate on your dock in your only port? I don't know. It's it's unbelievable. He roll reversed you so smooth. <laughs> the first debate between Trump and Biden is in Cleveland. I doubt it'll happen. I seriously doubt it'll happen. I don't think Trump will debate. He he will cite corona reasons or anything else. I don't think he will debate. If you guys have seen his recent two uh, uh, interviews, the last one with Axios, devastating. Absolutely devastating. My ex-husband did the fuel system in the Air Force. Oh, really? Well, no, no, no. So he worked on the fuel system. I just, I was the delivery person. I didn't actually work on like the tanks or anything. <laughs> Avocado, avocado. <laughs> hey, by the way, uh, I put in, I put in all the stuff for the artwork. So I'm hoping I put in for, uh, for all the loyalty badges and I put in for six new emotes, six new emotes. We'll see how that goes. Mark Rober. I don't know who that is. Uh, let's see. Well, I mean, somebody made the decision to bring that dangerous cargo into the port. And then a lot of people ignored any calls to get rid of that dangerous cargo. And yeah, so unfortunately, uh, I think there was probably a lot of corruption. Look, in the Philippines, it's the same thing. Like if, if somebody mails me a package and, and I'm, I'm living in the Philippines and I go to pick it up, the post office worker is going to expect a tip from me in order to give them, for them to give me my package. Like this isn't, this isn't like something unique. Like this is how greed and corruption works. And unfortunately it's usually the civilians that pay for it. It's really messed up. That's the only way he'll win by debating Biden. No, I think he'll lose by, by debating Biden. Like, I don't think Biden's mind is, is a hundred percent either, but the horrific shit that comes out of Trump's mouth when he talks, that is what's sealing the deal. He's lost so much of his base already because of it. 
Like Biden is not the best choice. I do not want a Biden presidency. But if you put both of them on the stage, I'm telling you, Donald Trump has way more to lose. He crawled into the tanks. Yeah, so he was probably what we referred to either. He was in either um, cell, uh, fuel cells, or he was working in fuel cells, which is in the, like the wing of the plane, which is super scary. Or he was in uh, LFM, liquid fuels maintenance, and he was the one that like managed all the tanks and stuff. Hey, if you guys got to run, no worries. How are you today? Hey, King Puppy, nice to see you. I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. That's why he won last election. Well, he, he won last election because people were so gaslit that they felt like Obama was so evil that they needed somebody that was not a politician to save them. And, and now we know what a, not a politician does. Let's see. Yeah, I mean, you know, all this stuff, disinfectant and, you know, injection, it's all bad. It's all super bad. All right, let's move on. <sighs> Beirut was terrible. There'll be more to come. I just wanted to address this up front. I wanted to read what actually happened so people have the background. I mean, obviously, I can't inform everybody, but I can try to do my part. You know what I mean? So what I also want to talk about, and this this kind of like all, we you know, so I read this to you guys. Actually, I want to go to this one first because... This one's kind of interesting. I'm not going to read the article. It's not about the article itself. It's about the content that goes into it. So Google pulled 2,500 China-linked YouTube channels over disinformation. And this is, the, this is a topic I, I kind of would like to talk about, right? I would like to talk about this because in the last 20 years, the Internet has made it so easy to pass on dis disinformation, conspiracy theories, just thoughts, you know, you could just log on in the morning and be like, hey, just so you know, X, Y, Z is a pedophile. And then you could go back to sleep while the rest of the world literally goes on about what you just said. There's a few really important topics that affect our world, but this one might affect us even more so than many others. The fact that anybody can put up a YouTube video. Anybody can post a tweet. Anybody can put whatever they want on the internet. I, I have plenty of websites. Nobody challenges my website content. Nobody verifies the information I put on there. I can be sued for libel. I can be sued for slander. But nobody like tells me what I can and cannot put up there. And the more this goes on, like I used to have a website called uh, Three Kilograms, and it was it was a platform meant for debate. I would put up like a topic, like Windows versus Apple, right? And I would put my my thoughts in there, and then I would I would basically open it up for a debate, so people could come in, pick their side, and debate for it. And that was a time of the internet where you could do more of that without people taking it serious. I felt like people people understood that it was for fun and not something you kill somebody over. And I believe the world's changed a little bit. Actually, I think the world's changed a lot in the last 20 years. I think some people have gotten smarter. I think some people have gotten wiser. Smart and wise aren't really the same thing. I, I, think, I think the internet has given more good than bad. But the unfortunate part, the bad part, has been horrendous. You know, everything from somebody getting told like, hey, somebody's a really bad person. And then they go home and they start making pipe bombs and mailing it to politicians. The internet has become a very dangerous thing. And what I'm most scared about is over the last, especially in the U.S. I don't know if it if it's like this in your country. You can you know chime in obviously if you want. But I feel like we have done such a good job at taking budgets away from schools, to making school more difficult, to basically making education difficult to attain. Therefore, we have dumber people. 
We have a lot more dumber people. And now, now because we have the internet, because we have everything going on, they can't discern bad information from good information. This is a huge problem. This is a big problem. I'm trying to politely say that we have a lot more dummies. But we, we have people that don't understand uh, good from bad. Let me see. Hydroxychlorine is multiplicative and not additive. Yeah, well, that's just bad anyway. They're trying to turn a profit. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make that happen. They're pushing medication that doesn't belong in our bodies. Because if I'm not mistaken, hydrochloroquine, uh, uh, that will actually cause like heart attacks and stuff like that. It's a nuke and it's revenge somehow. Is just so... Yeah, that's beyond messed up. Like in my world... Like that kind of stuff right there is hateful and I do not tolerate it. I am probably one of the most fair people you will ever meet. I will listen to both sides and then I will tell one side to completely fuck off. How do you feel about big tech censoring stuff on their website as a public forum rather than a publisher? Yeah, that's, that's a monster right there. Markesh. That's, that right there is probably another huge, huge thing as far as all this goes. Do we allow these companies the the one hundred percent right to put whatever they want? Because you got a website like brettbart.com, uh, you have the Daily Caller, you have plenty of websites that are just posting hateful misinformation. Do I trust Google to filter out right from wrong for me? No. And it's because of what I always talk about. Because these companies are underneath no obligation to do so. Their only existence in life is to make as much money as possible. That's it. How much money can they make for themselves, the CEOs, the, the, the people that invested, all of that? So what incentive do they have other than advertisers might boycott them? That's it. Oh, no. Oh, no. The boycotts. That's the only, like, weapon we have against them. And even then, you can't really boycott them because most of these companies are so huge. I need, I need a Democratic Senate with a majority. I need a Democratic House of Representatives with a majority. And I need a Democratic president that want to go full bore. I want them to take care of this. We need to fix our government. And we need to do it once and for all. I firmly believe 2020 is going to be an absolute blowout as far as uh, Democratic wins. I think we'll see more Democrats put in office in 2021 than ever before. Yeah, no, people don't want to listen to educated people. I told my friend, I'm like, why are you not listening to me? Like you have, you graduated high school. I, I went around the world. I did 20 years, uh, you know, doing diplomatic stuff, doing military stuff, working for the federal government. I said, I have almost eight years of college underneath my belt. Why are you not listening to anything I said? Did I say something in the past that was wrong that I didn't back up? He was more mad at me that I was an educated snob. Than, than what I was saying, whether it was right or wrong. Yeah, well, I don't trust... I mean, listen, I don't trust explosions either when they first happen. But I usually, like, hold my tongue. I wait for the experts to dig in, and then they tell me, like, hey, just so you know, this is what happened. I'd be like, oh, thanks, man. I'm glad I didn't really, like, just knee-jerk reaction that. That would have been awful. Uh, dumber people, that's the thing. This behavior isn't really new. For example, before the internet, a uh, local newspaper ran the craziest article submitted by loonies. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Sensual, uh, sensationalized videos, uh, podcasts. Like, listen, anybody can do what I'm doing right now. Like, if I was, if I was a really bad person, like, if I was, like, if I had zero morals, I had no empathy, I could give a shit less. Uh, I could come on here right now and and just tell you guys. I could gaslight you and tell you that it was you know so and so that went in there and set that bomb off 
and we need to start a war and this and that. Like, I could go that route. Anybody could. That's the scary part. The fact that I I have chosen to turn on my mic, to invest my money into a studio, to try to put out good information, something that's beneficial, is rare. And I'll tell you why it's rare. It's rare because everybody wants 15 minutes of fame. Everybody – can I show you guys something real quick? I just want to – here, I, I want to show you what I mean. I'm going to show you my Facebook group, the podcast one. Let me uh, – Hold on one second. Oh, I hey, I ordered a new switch last night for my basement. I paid 150 bucks for a 48 port gigabit PoE. Uh, that's power over a- a- Ethernet switch, and it's so good. All right, hold on one second. Where is that? I gotta I gotta bring this up real quick. All right, I want to show you this. How do I how do I change over here real quick? Let's go. Let's go this one. And I'm just going to change. Here we go. All right. This, I, I'm just showing you this to kind of give you some insight of what I mean. So I started this, I think, like a few years ago. I never did anything to it. Didn't promote it. Nothing. This is my, this is my podcaster support group. This is specifically so I can help people learn how to podcast. I want to be able to teach people how to promote their podcast, how to get their audio tuned in, how to do social media, how to do all that. I don't put a lot of effort into this because I have my own website specifically for that, and that's the AM Podcast Network. But I figure, what what could it hurt to do just a little bit more here? I have 1,800 members without trying. Without trying. Some of the bigger ones have like way, way, way more members. I was part of one podcast group like eight years ago that had something to the tune of 5,000 members. So I bet you if I started searching on Facebook, I could find groups that have at least 10,000 members in it. Why is that scary, Unjacked? Why, why do you mean? Why is it scary? It's scary because these are there's 1,800 people that want to have their own podcast if they don't already. And they're just churning out hundreds and thousands of, of hours. And I don't know if any of these people are doing it with good intentions, with bad intentions. Maybe these, these are all people that want to reach more people. And they're willing to clickbait. They're willing to debate you. They're willing to talk about really risque things with risque uh, opinions. They're willing to tread and peddle in misinformation in order for you to become a fan or to at least click and listen to an episode. Podcasting is one of the most popular mediums today. And the, 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 the barrier to entry, sorry, had to gather that word. The barrier to entry is about $10 and a computer. Not even, you can pretty much do it right on your phone. You can go to Amazon and purchase like a little thing to stick in, the, you know, either Bluetooth or like stick in the headphone jack and you have a mic. It could be the shittiest podcast, but seriously, the difference between you and a podcast is how much time do you have and can you put a reasonable 30 minutes to an hour together? That's it. So now you have technology that is so easy, so cost effective. Couple that with people that don't know, like barely how to tie their own shoes. And, and it's a tinderbox. Like this is how we get here. This was like the perfect storm of stupid people and misinformation. And that's how we got to 2020. <laughs> I'm sorry. Listen, I'm not trying to like just bring like dark news here, but I just feel like it's a conversation worth having. Educated snob, you can't be smart. We got it. Well, you know, they they said I was an elitist because of my education. <laughs> oh, sorry, man. I put in a lot of work to learn things. I opened my mind up and I accepted some information. Of course, then I went and verified it as well. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy, I tell you. I don't know what you do with it. <clears throat> 
Like how many people like like I think about like how many people come into my stream and they're like, "Hey, I'm going to start streaming." Yeah, anybody can almost stream. Like I I've I've heard people streaming from their mobile, from console, from their computer. It is seriously just as easy as just firing up your device, connecting to the internet and just putting your thoughts out there. Just what if they're all keem stars or h3 h3 wait is h3 h3 horrible uh i don't really watch hilda and ethan i thought they were reasonable i i've i've never heard anything negative necessarily about them but keem star keem star from what from everything that I, if you take what the internet says about keem star he sounds like about a 200 like pound human tumor of cancer. I mean, he's been banned from YouTube. Like I'm not trying to indict the guy. Like, I don't know him. He might just be putting on a show for all I, I could give a shit. But the information that I've seen him put out on the internet is super bad. He used to be nice, but he's become an arrogant asshole. It's because that is what makes money. Being a nice guy. Listen, you guys have all heard the saying like, Oh, nice guys finish last. Oh, she's not going to date him. He's a nice guy. Well, it's true in business, too. Nice guys don't finish on top. Wait, that's bad phrasing. Sometimes nice guys do finish on top, if you know what I mean. But nice guys usually don't become rich, don't become famous or anything like that. And so, yeah, Keemstar probably looked at his numbers and said, wow, how do I, how do I get this up? And then he probably switched the, the script a little bit and everybody was like, oh, finally, an asshole arrived. <laughs> it's bad. I don't know. I don't watch H3H3, though. I, I've watched a couple of their clips. I don't really find them that humorous, though. Have you ever seen the amount of shares of the memes from? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's off the chart. People love that kind of stuff. Yeah, they're not real. Nobody validates anything. Like, I will not share a single thing on social media unless I have validated it through multiple sources. I've talked about it. It's it's just insane. Because people want to fire and they want to forget. They're like, yeah, this is interesting. Boom, right on the Facebook page. And then out they go to the next thing because they ain't got time for that. That's the other problem. People need to slow the fuck down and just relax. Yeah, even the page and meme itself can be say, oh yeah, because people don't read past the title. That's the problem with the onion. Have you guys ever seen like everybody knows what the onion is, right? Do I have to go to that too? Hold on. Just 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 so we're on the same page, okay? Hey, let me switch back to my uh my other Firefox here. I need to I need to get this zoned in too, right? All right, so let's let's go back to this one and I'll open it up from there. Uh, boom, there it is. The onion. The onion. This one gets more confusion than anything else. This is a full satire uh, news website. Like, it's one of the best in the world, bar none. If you want satire, the onion is there for you. And then we have this military one, and it's called the Duffel Blog. They did it before I could. So I was in the, I was in the midst. I love writing sat satire. I'm a huge fan of writing, writing satire. I used to do it on my uh, website called 2kilograms.com. It's down right now, but that's where I used to write all my comedy and stuff with my, with my other funny friends. The duffel blog is the military arm of the news satire world. I was going to do something very similar to this. And these like five guys got together and they did it and it just they did it better than I could have. They've done so well. Federal agents feel like he never really came back from Portland. <laughs> Treating it like a true war zone. This if you guys want to see what the dark side of the US military thinks, the funny dark side, uh just read the duffel blog. You'll find it. Airmen charged with not having enough rank to mi to mishandle classified information. 
Oh Jesus Christ! Okay, I got, I got to get, I got to get off of that. I'll get lost in that rabbit hole right there. Heard of it, but not familiar. <clears throat> so, sarcasm and satire is one of the hardest things in English to understand and really dive into. It, it just is. It's difficult English because you have to understand so much that goes into it in order to get the joke. That's what makes satire like subtle and questionable. So like people post these links all the time on Facebook and the first comment is always absolutely always, yo, is this real? Like it's so, it's so plausible that it could be real. That's the kind of scary world we live in. This is what I'm talking about with misinformation. I think misinformation is one of the worst things that you could possibly put out there. Especially when it's intentional. So needless to say, years ago, I stopped writing satire. I, I stopped completely because I didn't want to be part of it. Like, I was doing it just to get people to giggle. Like, I wanted to put smiles on people's faces. You know, ground zero for smiles. But at the end of the day, like, I felt like people were, were not, like, understanding that it wasn't real. And that's the power of education. That's the lack of, of like, opening up your mind and learning new things. This is why Americans need to be forced to learn, like, a different language. We need to be, like, we need to go around the world, you know, and learn. Like, me, for, for me, living in South Korea, living in Saudi Arabia, living in uh, the Philippines, traveling to all the countries that I've been to, help me have empathy for the, for the world we live in. Like I actually have seen the poorest of the poor of the poor in a lot of these countries. It's nothing like I know. We don't, we don't have that here in the U S we have something very different. Usually our, our, our poor people, they, okay. So middle-class man falls on hard times, becomes poor, starts living under a bridge. After about a year of living underneath the bridge in four different seasons, hot, cold, mild, uh, he tends to go a little crazy because he's got nobody to talk to. He's got no money. His nutrition is absolutely awful. He's eating out of dumpsters. He's begging for money. He says, why am I doing this when I could be in that prison over there and I could be like fed three times a day. I could have a job. They'll give me clothes. I'll have a bed to sleep in. So some of them will go and commit a crime. And since we here in the U S lock up 25% of our population for money, you know, we, we put people in prison a lot of times just to make a buck off of it. And then the cycle is just, it just goes. I don't know if you guys experience this in your country, but if you're not getting the tone out of my voice, America is really fucked up right now. And there's so many people that have no idea. And they live here. They live here and they think everything is just fine. There's nothing to say here. Everything's fine. You know, it's just, I don't know. It's just, it, it hurts sometimes. It hurts. We try to get through it. We do. Oh, can I put something positive? I just want to put something positive. It's not that positive, but it's like a little positive. What do you guys think of this? Canada allows terminal patients use of magic mushrooms. Hey, do I have anybody have do, anybody watching right now? Have you ever used magic mushrooms? Do I have anybody in the chat that has ever experienced magic mushrooms? I'm just curious. I think this is this is not enough, but a step in the right direction, if that makes sense. Has anybody ever experienced psilocybin therapy? I'm just curious. Because it's really hard to understand it if you've never like experienced it. Canada is the new Netherlands in terms of drug uh, legality. I think it's heading that way, but... I also feel like it's it's still a far cry from anything to celebrate, if you know what I mean. 
Yo, is this right? Hold on. I'm just noticing this on the side. Daisy Coleman of Audrey and Daisy dead by suicide at 23. Jesus Christ, man. Oh, I didn't even look up the information. I need to find out about why the FBI uh, searched Jake Paul's home, too. That was going to be part of today, but I didn't do that. Anyway, anybody? Magic Mushrooms? You really like mushrooms. I do. I do. And and I'm about to go on to like a 30-minute rant of why. <laughs> I smell a rant. I'm not a, a mush muncher due to the in, due to anxiety, but I believe in body autonomy for personal use. Well, I think that's that's a good rule of thumb. I didn't try psilocybin mushrooms until June 2018, and I'll give you some background on on what led me there. I'm certainly not ashamed of 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 it at all. If if anything. I, I hope that more people will open up their minds and maybe give it a shot. So seven years ago, I had the issue with my neck. I'll, I'll try to make this quick, okay? Had the issue with my neck. Uh, they didn't know what was wrong with me. I went through bone scans. They said I had fibromyalgia. They said like I had all these things wrong with me. And, and whether I do or not, it's still inclin- inconclusive. But they gave me medicine, and I was taking 20 pills a day. And I was wearing a benzodiazepine patch. Oh, I think I said it right, actually. It's a pain patch. It's not an opiate, but it's very similar. So three times a day, I was taking Xanax. Three times a day, I was taking you know sleeping pills. I was, t- I was taking like aspirin. I was taking gabapentin. And I was taking Lyrica. Lyrica specifically. Lyrica is a nerve blocker. Because they felt like it was the nerves like firing off when they shouldn't be in my neck. And they were probably somewhat right on that. But I was on Lyrica for three years. And for me, the side effects was complete u- uh, lack of use of brain. Like I became a vegetable. I would go to work. I would get there at 7 and just sit there and stare at a screen for like two hours. Nothing there. Just staring. Like, I honestly felt like I was a mushroom. Short-term memory loss. I couldn't make a complete sentence. I started sending people that worked for me to, uh, to meetings because I was so afraid of, of, like, my condition and what it would do. Fast forward three years, and my, my cognitive abilities were basically switched off. I moved back to the U.S. because I couldn't get the support I needed where I was, and uh, I needed medical help. So I came back, and I wanted to be around family to help me get through this. So I came here to New Hampshire, started seeing the VA, and during this time, I was doing a lot of research. I had always been a huge uh, cannabis supporter. Like I believe in, in CBD. I believe in, in THC. I believe in all of that. And then I, I wasn't really familiar with mushrooms because when I grew up, I grew up in the city. Nobody had mushrooms. Nobody even talked about them. But now that I'm an adult, I've heard more people talk about psychedelic mushrooms and the trips and everything else. I'm listening to Joe Rogan. I'm trying to take in a lot more information. And so I asked my brother, I'm like, hey, do you know anybody that might be able to get me like a gram or two of mushrooms? And uh, he knew a guy that would, you know, go through the woods and pick them. And like a month later, I ended up finding some. And me and my brother did them at his house uh, one night. I didn't feel anything from it, but I didn't have any pain in my neck for the first time for three days afterwards. Zero pain. I didn't like go on a trip. I don't see visuals when I do my psychedelics. I didn't touch them again for almost another year. That one experience changed a lot of my views. It made me rethink a lot of different things. It controlled my depression, my anxiety. I haven't taken a Xanax in three years, three years. And, uh, it's crazy because it hits, it hits people differently. Some people, it'll send their anxiety through the roof. If they're not with somebody that could, you know, guide them to be there as their like safety net. 
So like I'm always everybody's safety net. If somebody needs like somebody to just kind of sit with them while they're going through their trip or whatever, I'm down. I'm super down. I want to explain from my point of view what mush- what mushrooms feels like when you take them. I'll answer any questions, by the way, if anybody has them. Uh, they're disgusting to chew. They're absolutely gross tasting. I do not like mushrooms. I don't like the taste of them or anything. But sometimes you just got to grit and bear with it. That's what orange juice is for. I'm just scared of everything, basically, except weed. Hey, you got to start somewhere. At least you're not scared of weed. You're an adult. I thought you were a nine-year-old girl. Oh, no, no, only sometimes. It depends when my bipolarness uh, kicks in. I'm kidding about that. Your next YouTube vid's going to be lit. Oh, no. You think so? <laughs> Do you, you think so? I don't, I don't know. All right, let me explain what mu- how I feel when I take mushrooms. So mushrooms, I, I always recommend people take no more than like one gram to start. Just a simple little dose. It won't take you anywhere. It's enough to make you feel like you've definitely eaten some psilocybin. You can take it in tea. You can just chew one up like I do and just get through it. You can do a lot of things to get there. It's just, it's just one of those things. So I'll take anywhere from one gram if I'm like, like maybe I'm mowing the lawn or I'm doing things around the house, and you know if I happen to have some, I'll I'll take one gram. So the first two hours, I feel tired. I could take a nap. You know, the psilocybin hits, you're like, oh, man, I don't really feel that good. I'm a little tired, a little exhausted. And then right around that, like, one and a half to two hours, it's like the Kool-Aid man busts through the door and does the, oh, yeah, right? And then it just grabs you, and then you go and party. Like, I, I want to build shit. Like, I want to fix stuff. I want to I want to just have so much fun. I'm laughing, I'm telling jokes. Like I'm having a good time. That lasts for about 5 hours. It peaks right about at the 5 6 hour mark. And then you spend the next 5 hours coming down a little bit, a little at a time. Sometimes it upsets my stomach for the next like 2 or 3 hour or next next like 2 or 3 days my stomach will be a little upset. But you want to try to take it on an empty stomach. You just want to drink like a glass of orange juice and try to take them on an empty stomach. You won't be hungry. After you get the, the mushrooms, you won't be hungry. It just You just got to get through like the first couple hours. But that's that's like the physical part of taking them. For the next three to five days sometimes, I have zero pain in my body. Like I don't feel the crushing pain that I feel right now in my neck. Like as I sit here, my pain on a scale to one to ten is probably a six. Like the fact that I even sleep these days is surprising. That's why yesterday I was so excited about getting the phone call for the shots. So the magic mushrooms also opens my mind. And when I take them with friends and family, like we have deeper conversations. I feel like our community gets a little bit tighter and I think we can understand each other's like, like what's going on a little bit better. So I try to do mushrooms. I don't know. There, there are times that I go four to six months without taking any. And then there's times that I do it twice in a week. (laughs) I haven't done them in a while though. I think it's been, at least two months since I've done them. I've never done them while I was streaming, just so everybody knows. I have never tripped while streaming. I'm actually kind of scared to do so. Not really. I can control it. I like you're in complete control, by the way. Like you don't I've never gone anywhere. I've taken six grams before. And I have never seen like pink elephants or anything like that. I've just been unbelievably high. Like think so Tyler, think about the time that you were the most stoned in your life. And then times it by 5. Let's see. Guy said the future of his content creation is uncertain. Oh no, I need to reach out to him and see what's up. See if he's okay. I wonder if he needs something or if he's just busy. 
Ah, man, that's that's rough. I'll have to I'll have to ask him what's up. The safety net thing. Uh, I have a personality disorder. Don't think I really believe I have a safety net. You got you got to have a safety net. You have to have a safety net if if you're going to be doing these things. I do not recommend taking them alone, especially if you've never ever done them. Because I have seen people completely have like a moment of psychosis almost just fear that the world is coming down ultimate paranoia. If like, if you do not trust wholeheartedly the person that is with you through your first, even maybe even your second trip, don't do it. Just don't do it. And then never take mushrooms. If you're upset, if you're sad, like only take them if you are in a reasonably good mood. And the reason being is because whatever your attitude is right then and there, mushrooms are going to do nothing but amplify it. So if you're happy, man, you're going to Disney World. If you're sad, I don't know where that's going to take you, and I would be very scared. So I highly recommend that you understand your environment, do some reading, do some research, know, know your own. High on weed or other things? On weed. On weed. I've done a couple other stuff. Yeah. Like I've done – the only things I've done is I've smoked weed, oil. I mean every – every I've done every version of cannabis basically. Edibles, oil, all of it. Hash, whatever. Um, I've done LSD and I've done um, – I've done mushrooms I, and, and mushrooms are my preferred, believe it or not. Like if somebody, if a gnome showed up in my room at like midnight and woke me up and said, yo, unjack, get up. I'm like, what's up, dude? What's up? He's like, listen, I hate to say this, but you can only either have weed or mushrooms for the rest of your life. I'm like, yo dog, the weed's right there in top drawer. You can go ahead and get that. Take it out of here, man. Cause you ain't taking my mushrooms. Seriously, that's how highly I think of mushrooms. So yes, I do talk about I talk about mushrooms like Joe Rogan talks about DMT. <laughs> and and just so you guys know, I do want to try uh smoking DMT and trying MDMA at least once. Those are the only two things I can think of that I have never done that I want to try. I've done magic mushrooms years ago. I think they're amazing. If done correctly and done with the right people, I think that it, they're just so beneficial. It's not even funny. What's up, Comedy Pickle? Nice to see you. Uh, I felt like I was melting to the floor. My mistake. I did it on my own. Yeah. you. I don't know if your experience was good or not, but I can tell you, if if you're able to, give it a try with somebody somebody that you trust. Like For me, I don't... Like I wouldn't want to do that with somebody that I'm in a relationship with specifically because I don't know the things I'm going to say. And I always fear like I might say something that's in my mind and I, I wouldn't want to hurt the other person. So typically I don't necessarily want to do it with the person I love. However, I do it with the people I love all the time. I've gotten past that fear. Just, just tread lightly. That's all I say. Just tread lightly. Like I thought I was going to be completely out of control. I thought it was going to be like somebody giving me a truth serum serum. Uh, like I was in, you know, interrogated by the enemy or whatever. Like, I don't know. Okay. I did it. I did it. Like, I didn't want to leave. <laughs> I, I'm always afraid I'm going to let all my skeletons out of my, out of my closet, or I'm going to start telling stories that are hurtful to other people. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. I've done weed, of course. I've also taken Coke and MDMA. That was the worst one. Really? MDMA? Like, I've never done Coke, and I don't think I would. Like, I've already heard that Coke is not as good as people say it is. And, and even then, I, you could OD over it, off of it, and, and I don't want any part of that either. Like, I only want to do uh, those kind of things that will make sure that I'm still here tomorrow. I have too many people depending on me to be messing around like that. Dude, you know how crushed like my kids would be or anything like if that happened? So I, I have to be responsible enough to keep myself alive. I used to do other drugs back then. Now I only smoke weed. 
I, I'm a firm believer in like weed mushrooms. Like I think those two, especially used in conjunction. So like if you feel like your mushroom experience is getting out of control, roll a joint and go smoke it. I usually don't smoke until I'm at least an hour three or four of the mushrooms. That's usually when I'm like, yeah, I could smooth this this trip out a little bit, and then I'll usually do that. But that's how that's how I do it, and I think that these benefits here we'll fl- we'll flip back for anybody just tuning in. So we were talking about Canada is allowing terminal patients use of magic mushrooms, and I think this is important because when you know you're gonna die, you probably have a lot of anxiety until you learn to accept your fate. Like we're all gonna die, but there's a lot of people like my dad. My dad was a terminal patient of cancer, you know, and his anxiety, the panic attacks he would go through were just so monstrous. Like they were so big. I always felt really, really bad for him. I wish I could have gave him magic mushrooms. I think that would have actually benefited him more. And I think he would have like mentally prepared himself for death a little bit better had he had access to psilocybin. I think psilocybin is super important for veterans, for people with uh, PTSD, with people that have anxiety, depression. It's not for everybody. It's definitely not. Like You need to know what your limits are. You need to know what's going to help you. But I can tell you this. Since I started taking mushrooms, I am way nicer of a person my depression has been completely managed. Like, I mean, if I, you know, if I decided to just go off of this, I'd probably be right back to where I was. But while I'm, I'm trying to do this, like, like I don't feel like I used to feel like, I know it's still there, but I feel like in the current state of how I'm, I'm taking care of myself, I feel like it's managed. Like, no different than if my doctor sent me pills, you know, that, like that, that kind of managed. Like, I don't need to take man-made pills to manage the stuff. I don't need Xanax. And, you know, that's, that's how I got off my medications. The only medication that I wasn't, that I wasn't able to uh, come off of was my light dose of, like, high blood pressure medicine. Yeah, so health-wise... The mushrooms have been unbelievable. I also think that the mushrooms helped with uh, like stem stem any kind of like weight gain, like from eating too much, being bored. Like it gave me energy. I started accomplishing things around the house. I became fun to hang out with. Like the, the, all listen, it's all pros. The only con was you might have a little bit of loose stool for the next three days. That's about it. Because I don't know what it does with the digestive tract, but it kind of wrecks it a little bit. Just a, just a little bit. Uh, let's see. That's why I try to watch what I say because there's certain drugs I can't lie on. Yeah, absolutely, right? And there's some, there's some skeletons that really should stay in the closet. There's a lot of stories I could be telling on this podcast that would probably make this a really popular podcast to watch. I could tell you some stories that would make you guys go, holy shit, people do that? And and I'd be like, yeah, man, I did that. But I'd rather those just stay in the closet. We'll just, we'll come up with new stuff to talk about. <laughs> I was prescribed Adderall, so basically did meth. Yeah, I was on, uh, I was on Concerta for three years, which is an amphetamine. And it was like being on meth. It's legalized meth. And the mushrooms have helped me deal with that as well. I don't, I don't need concern anymore. When I found out I had a baby on the way, I stopped. It completely changed me finding out I would be a dad. Uh, you know, being, becoming a dad can change people in so many different ways. So many different ways. I've only done the LSD once straight after. And it messed me up. Oof. I definitely for psychedelics. I like to take breaks. What stuff do I take? I don't take anything now. I don't, I don't take anything now. 
I smoke as much pot as a, a human could possibly smoke. I learned how to bake with my marijuana. So I make muffins, I make cupcakes, I make gummy worms, I make candy. Like I, I'm able to make any kind of edibles. I know how to make uh, cannabis oil and can of butter. I, uh, I know how to press my own oil. I know how to do bubble hash. I know how to do all that stuff. I learned all of this. Thanks to YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. Hey, I liked and subscribed. <laughs> Last time I saw a whale riding a unicorn. Really? Ah, see, I want these thoughts. I, I never got there. For some reason, I never, ever got there. He said a word that means poop. <laughs> I did. That's true. Mushrooms are better when your mind set is in the right place. You have to be in the right set. For, for, for psychedelics, you want to 100% be in the right frame of mind. Because if you're not, it's only going to amplify that, and, and that's what's going to happen. Uh, so, yeah, definitely get there when you can. You know what I mean? I stopped when I had kids in my life change for the better. You know, the funny thing is, let's talk about it from kids' point of view. So I have five kids, and, and my kids have seen me go through the transitions of being 100% perfectly fine and then having my medical conditions, and now they see how I manage it, and they are so supportive. I will say that my kids have, like, like circled around me and become one of my, my most important safety and, like, health nets that I could possibly have. If your kids understand why you are doing something and they believe that it's it's beneficial to you and them, then they'll they'll support you. They'll 100% support you. Now, if I came home and I told my kids that I was, you know, going to do some crack and shit, like they'd probably be like, "Yeah, let's not. Let's not do that." But they they're they're super supportive because they've watched me go through those those phases, and you know I was on morphine for like three years. I was constantly sick. It was awful. Opiates are some of the worst things that you can put in your body, and I regret ever ever doing it. Just hem the bottom of these shorts during this podcast. Thanks, Unjacked. Hey, you're welcome. You're welcome. See, we're all getting things done. We're all doing it. My kid being uh, looked after by my adopted because of the drugs I took. Yeah, I mean, listen, some people go into really bad places. I know plenty of people that have gone through a stint and their kids just weren't better off with them at that moment. It doesn't make them a bad parent. I mean, unfortunately, in that moment, it does, right? I mean... I don't know what else you call it, right? You're not a good parent if if your kids are in foster care. It's not the shit on anybody. I'm just saying that the sooner we recognize that we have had a failure as an adult or as a parent or whatever, the sooner we can get back to correcting that and hopefully making up. Like I wasn't a great dad when I when I first became a dad. I was 19 years old. I was 19 when my oldest son was born. Show me a 19-year-old that is ready to be a dad. Just show me one. Because I have yet to see one in my 42 years. Even my parents. My mom had me when she was 17 years old. My mom is literally 17 years older than me. That's it. And I'm 19 years older than my son. That's not much. It's not much. But as you develop into a human being, by the time you're 25... Your brain finalizes the third phase of brain development for boys and girls. But sometimes girls wrap it up a little bit sooner than boys. You know, that's the way puberty works. Most of you guys probably know that. And, you know, so 25, like I always joke. Well, back in the day, I used to joke like I wouldn't date a girl that was younger than 25. I don't want to I don't want to date or marry a girl that hasn't finished brain development. Because you don't, I feel like you don't become a real human being until after that. Obviously, you know, some people finish up early. Some people finish up a little bit later. Maybe they're 26, 27. That's why we have all these crazy people. Because their brains haven't finished developing. It's nuts. 
My kid being, oh, no, sorry, I already read that one. If I didn't have weed, my kid would probably hate me, not going to lie. Well, let's see. I mean, at least you know, like, what helps. Hopefully your kid understands that, too. Having beat, beat. Not fun for people around you, unfortunately, it helps me. Oh, yeah. No, that I mean, that is just, that's a rough situation. Yeah, my kids know I can turn into a mess pretty quick. Honestly thought I, I was, to be honest, from the age of 14, I was waiting to be a dad and what happened. Uh, when it happened, things just fall apart. Harsh times, yeah, man. Like, like people at that age, they're not ready, man. Like, I got through it, thankfully, because I was in the military and they forced me. I didn't have a choice. Like, they they literally, like, forced me, like, you will be a good person. You will do this. You will do that. And that was the only thing that got me through. Because let me tell you, I could tell you stories from the time I was like 18 to 25, and these are the ones that, that would make your head spin. They'd be like, whoa, you did that? And I'm not even saying like bad stuff. I'm just saying like I partied hard, like really hard. I was adopted twice and spent time in foster care, Gremlin. We love our uh, mamas. I love all four of mine. That's amazing. To have that many good people in your life is incredible. Like I obviously I've never experienced that. I don't know what it's like to be in foster care. I had a mom and dad. They were split, two different households. That's the worst I have. So it's you know whatever. It's it's whatever. But man, being able to have that many people in your life that's pretty important. This is all really important. <clears throat> I didn't even cover like that many subjects, I feel like, on today's Tay's podcast. But, you know, I, I feel like I covered the ones that kind of mean the most to me today. And at, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Do you guys have any questions about mushrooms? Anybody? I mean, I'll, I'll feel free to answer anything that you guys have. We're not done yet, by the way. I'm not wrapping this up yet. All amazing women. It takes amazing women to uh, to raise a village. I think men have their parts, but it's not as as like women play a much better role, and I'm good with that. I have my role. My wife has her role, and uh, we we fill it very well, and it's very complimentary. But having having good, high quality women in your life is super important. Like, I couldn't imagine not having the women I have in my life. I have three daughters and a wife, and um, I, I am, I'm just I, – I don't like to use the word blessed, but I mean it in that sense without the God part, <laughs> if that makes sense. Times are tough, but it made us stronger because I'm still in the care system for 17 years counting, so I know where you're coming from. Yeah, see – it's nice to meet other people that understand where you're coming from as well. So you have some kind of like support network. I feel like support networks are underrated, especially in times like this. You know, you got quarantine, you got bad news around the world, the economies are flailing, like governments are failing their people, immigration statuses have been stopped, like people are out of work, people don't know where the next meals are coming from. To have a good support network is is not as easy as it used to be it used to be your neighbors were good like in the 80s or whatever you'd go over to your neighbors and borrow a cup of sugar no big deal but again the internet has made it to where you could wall off your neighbors like you know i've lived in this neighborhood for three years i know all of my neighbors i've had a couple talks with them but i don't really know my neighbors like they don't know me they don't even know i smoke weed like, I've made a few jokes about it. They don't even know that, I bet. I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they do. Maybe. But I don't need them. I don't really need my, my neighbors because I have people to talk to right here. I've, my, the internet has replaced my block parties. <laughs> Actually, coronavirus has. <laughs> That's the only bad thing. But having a, a proper support network, people that love you, people that you can pick up the phone and be like, hey, listen, I need like five to ten minutes and I'm going to cry through most of this, but I, I need to get something off my chest and you're the only person that will listen. If you can do that right now to somebody, you're in a good place. 
I would say you're in a good place. If you can accomplish that, you know, that's, that's just a lot of people don't have that anymore. A lot of people don't have the networks. And those, those are the things that scare me. So I try to open up my door to anybody. If somebody were to show up at my driveway and ask if they could have an hour of my time to just talk through life, I would go grab two chairs and have a seat with them. Like, I just believe that it's super important. Having the social connectivity, ha having all of that is important for mental health, physical health, and all that. Spliff time. Nice. I'll be, I'll be doing that in a few, in a few moments. I'll be doing that. I'm going to go grab, uh, grab all of my tools as we get ready for the, uh, second half of the stream. So I'm really glad. I'm really glad that not only have I met you guys, but uh, I'm glad to hear that you guys have some kind of support network too. Having people care about you is so important. Yeah. If nobody cares about you, then why should you exist? At the end of the day, if you wake up and there's not one person on this planet that gives a shit that you just woke up, then, then what is the incentive to being here? And there's probably none, which I think that's why we're seeing a rash of suicide, especially in the celebrities. Um, normal people, of course. Mental health is not being addressed. And that might be something we dive into maybe uh, in a future podcast as well. I think mental health is is being severely overlooked because you can't see it. When when I get a cut on my arm, like you know, if I take a razor blade and just go right there, I mean, one, it'd be gross and it would hurt. But people would be like, "Holy shit, his arm is cut. He needs a band aid." And uh, and then I would get a band aid, and people would send me on my way. But when your brain is broken, people can't see that. It can't be like, holy shit, there's a leak in his brain. And so if you don't see it, it must not be true. That's the unfortunate part. I think that's also a big part of, of the world's problem right now. There's so many like invisible injuries that, that we can't comprehend it right now. We don't understand the human brain enough. Man, I wish Duncan Trussell was here right now. I so want to go on a journey with Duncan Trussell. Do you guys know who Dun Duncan Trussell is? He does uh, Joe Rogan's podcast. He does uh, the ministry. The, uh, the ministries is his podcast. I forget what it's actually called. The elderly also. So many of them are lonely and it's a huge problem. Yeah, it is a huge problem. It's twofold though. The elderly are so independent that they don't want to move in with their kids they don't want necessarily to show that they're weak. It's hard for some. And then society casts them out because we feel like they have no more use. Like, ah, he's just crazy, crazy Al over there. He's in his 80s. He'll be dead soon anyway. He's got nothing to offer us. Psychologists can. That's why it's so important that people seek help. Yeah, my oldest son, he's actually in the psychology program at the university. He actually wants to go into psychology. And you know what? I hope he makes a difference. I really do. We need more people out there that want to do good things. My oldest daughter would like to be a teacher. Uh, my my middle child wants to be an OBGYN. And we're still waiting on four and five to come through. One's going to be some kind of entertainer, I think. And one's going to be into computers. It's important to seek help, but accessibility and stigma are still an issue. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Military for the U.S. is like that, too. We used to tell people, don't go and seek help, man. As soon as you go see the, the base psychologist, dude, they're going to throw you out of the military. No pension, no health benefits, no money, no nothing. So people with PTSD from, like, the Gulf War, from, like, there was actually still people in from Vietnam when I joined the military. Like, they were at the end of their career. They, were, they, were, they saw the end of Vietnam and they were retiring when I was joining. And some of these guys were nuts, but they wouldn't seek help because they felt like it showed that they were weak. And it showed that they, um, yeah, that they couldn't be trusted with like classified information or anything like that. So nobody would seek help. Nobody. Like if you were in the military 
and your your parents were killed in a train accident. Your house was burned down. Like you just didn't tell anybody. Like you might mention it, be like, "Hey, just so you know, like you know, parents are dead and the house is burned down." But hey, I'm fine. I'm fine, man. I do everything's good here. You don't have to worry about that. I'll be at work tomorrow. Like stigma's real, and that was just my little world, you know. So on a big scale in your country, yeah, you go see the psychologist. Like you start telling people, like, "Yeah, I have a therapist," and people are like, "Ooh, that dude is like 35 and he's still doing therapy." That shit's real. Like, I was pretty messed up before I retired. I went and saw the psychologist for the first time, the psychiatrist. I just needed a, I just needed a good session. I just needed to shed some tears, tell him what was wrong with me. We talked for, like, you know, the first time was, like, two hours. The second time was almost three hours. I just needed to get some stuff off my, my mind, and I needed somebody to talk to. Unfortunately, I retired, and I couldn't see him anymore. <laughs> I don't really need it anymore. I, I feel like I have the network I need. And I hope that you guys do too. Man, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy, but mental health is one of those things that we need to take a little more serious. Hey, as we wrap up, I just want to say um, thank you guys for hanging out with me on this podcast. You know, I never know when somebody's going to, if somebody's actually going to enjoy the podcast, if somebody's going to, because obviously when I play the games, I get way more interaction, I get way more activity. But I, I feel like the podcast is so meaningful. At least it is to me. This is also a little bit of therapy. This is another way that I get my therapy in. You guys listen to me, and I get to just flow. Whatever's on my mind, it just goes out there. And it's nice because you guys comment, and I get to hear a little bit about y- you guys as well, and ladies, and ladies. And it's so nice because we're we're really a community like honestly i know some of you are probably like yeah i could tune in tomorrow or not it doesn't really matter but for me this is another way for my mental health to 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 be better that makes sense that makes sense at all listen i want to say thank you for watching thank you for being here oh hold on hold on we got a book we got a book to address let's see what it says Exactly. Like we tried to help my grandpa and he tried to have him go to a retirement home. Not because we hate him and think he's useless, but because he's so lonely and depressed right now. He didn't eat properly, got depressed after his wife died. And we just don't know uh, what more we can do for him. In the end, he decides, but it's getting worse and worse since uh, he made the decision not to build himself back up. My grandfather actually went through the same thing. Uh, Get his mental and physical health up and can I be honest here? Let's we'll end this in about five minutes because I kind of want to say a little something about it. it it's kind of to this point. My grandfather went through the same thing. I've been, I've been married to my wife. Um, we've been together over 16 years now. We've been together for over 16. We've been married. This is our 15th year of being married. So in February, we will celebrate 15 years. And she's my best friend. Like we might get upset with each other once in a while. We we might have, you know, issues here and there. But I couldn't imagine losing her. Now I'm 42. We have COVID. There's a lot going on. She drives to work every day. There's there's a lot of risk, right? You jump in a car, anything could happen. Uh, you go to work, you could catch COVID. You might not make it. Maybe you do make it. Like there's a lot of possibilities, right? The longer you're alive, the longer, you know, the more opportunities there are to snuff you out. And so once in a while, I get a little bit sad when I think about what it's going to be like, you know, if we make it to our 70s and our 80s and even our 90s, because eventually one of us are going to have to go first. And it's easier to say, I hope it's me so I don't have to deal with the emotional breakdown afterwards. But I know that when I'm older and if she goes first, which I, I seriously hope not, I, I will be like your grandfather. I would imagine the depression would be overwhelming to lose her. Like I couldn't have done and gotten this far without her. So I can only imagine what it would be like to be my grandfather when he lost his wife. Uh, she passed 
four years before he did. They were to they were married, I want to say forty years, maybe even fifty. I think they actually made it to fifty, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. Maybe one day you guys will be able to have that thought, like, and really have that thought. There's really no way that I can kind of wrap it up for you because you have to experience the thought of loving somebody to that degree. <clears throat> and I don't mean to make this all mushy and stuff like that. I just mean like if you, if, you can, if you can actually put yourself in somebody's shoes, like I said at the beginning, my mind is so visual that when you say something to me, I can visualize it. Like when you guys get kind of descriptive in some of your comments, I can actually put myself in your shoes. I do not like that necessarily. I'm not going to say it's a superpower or anything like that, but it, it is something that I almost wish I couldn't do because it's so vivid. And this is why I can empathize with some people to the degree that I can. I respect that. I lose my real family when I was seven younger. Dude, that's, I mean, that's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking is all I can say. All right. Those are just some thoughts. If you guys want to dig in that deeper, we can do it on the other side of the stream. Uh, if you guys want to talk about anything next podcast, all you gotta do is let me know and I'll write it down. We'll discuss it. Anything that I said here, if you want me to expand on it, please feel free to comment right below. Uh, don't forget to check the description. The link to uh, the Twitch channel will be there. I stream Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here in the U.S. I am ready to hang out with everybody. I love doing this. It's one of my favorite things. So if you want more of this and you're watching on YouTube right now, like, subscribe, please comment. Please give me a thumbs up, anything. Let me know that you're enjoying what I'm doing so I can put out more. And for those that will carry on over to Twitch, I see about five minutes. Let me get a little smoke in, reset the, the layouts, and uh, we'll get this thing started. I got so much more to talk about today. Anyway, give me about five, maybe ten minutes. I'm going to bring this stream down. I'm going to get the next stream up, and I'll see you on the balloon side. The podcast is good. That's number eight in the bag. Feels good, man. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. I'll see you in a few minutes. Let me get reset up. All right. Later, Gators.